Welcome, and we're going to talk today about Montasia fractures, but we're going to talk about Montasia fractures in children because they're a different entity and they're treated differently. As we've talked before, fractures in children are different because of the different biomechanical characteristics. So what do they call, what should we call these? They're not exactly just pure fractures. What should we call these? What were they called years ago? Fracture dislocations? No, actually lesions. And that's unfortunately, I mean, that's because that came from the original Spanish. You know, everybody knows about Montasia, uh, but who really gave the most contribution for fractures, uh, the Montasia lesions? And that's why they called lesions because of a Spanish t term. Who, who did that, you know? There wasn't anybody in the United States, uh, these lesions, it was Jose Luis Bedo, and he's from Montevideo, Uruguay. And he spent a lot of time and actually wrote this whole book on Montasia, uh, lesions, La Lesions of the Montasia, in which he popularized that. And he had this in Spanish, and then Ponsetti saw this and was able to get it into English, and it became in, it was about, only about 10 years later that it came into the English literature but he was from Montevideo, Uruguay, which is a fairly small country in South America. So what is the contribution that he made? The classification? That's right, his classification. And it's really kind of stood the test of time. Other people have tried other classifications, but his, I think, is the most useful, and it really has persisted. So he wrote this in his book in 1954, which has stood the test of time. So, he gave four types. So let's look at the four types. What's the type one? An anterior radial head dislocation. That's right, it's anterior radial head dislocation. And usually the fracture is a little bit more anterior. It's usually in the diaphysis of the, um, uh, um, of the ulna. And <clears throat> it's usually more of a green stick type of fracture. What about the type two? Type 2 is a posterior dislocation. That's right. And again, the fracture is a little bit more proximal. It's usually at the diaphyseal metaphyseal junction. Okay, now we go to type 3. It's uh, lateral to anterior lateral. That's right. Anterior lateral or mostly lateral. And again, the fracture is, is a kind of a green stick fracture in the uh, olecranon. And the type 4? Uh, radial head fracture with an olecranon fracture. Yeah, well, no, actually, it's a fracture of both the radius and all the shafts that occur, plus the dislocation. And these are very rare. Type 2 and type 4 are very rare. Type 3 is pretty common, and so is the most common one is the type 1. So we'll go through each one of these, the characteristics and management of the Beto types. So we will start here with the injury patterns. And again, as we've emphasized in the past sessions, it's very important that you understand the classification, that you understand the structure, the treatment, and the possible complications. And we'll go through these. So we have type one. This is the most, what's the most obvious thing that you see? I uh, see a uh, ulna fracture with the anterior head, radial head dislocation. Yes, right. Well, the first thing that gets your attention is the, fra is the obvious fracture of the uh, obvious fracture here of the ulnar shaft, real diaphyseal fracture. But you need to look at it a little bit different structurally. And so what kind of fracture, failure fracture, how did this fail? In, in tension, bending? Tension. Yeah, actually it's really kind of a tension fracture, failed in tension. So it, it's a bending force and it failed on the tension side and remained intact on the other and we call these green stick fractures. And so the apex is anterior. And how does the radial head go? Anterior. Anterior. So it goes anterior as well. So what's the overall direction pattern of these two injuries? Is anterior. That's right. It's an, it's, it's, it's an extension type of injury pattern. Now, years ago, actually in our first edition of our textbook, in, uh, also in the literature, we talked about this was designed as a 
defined as an isolated frag isolated dislocation of the radius, the radial head. So is this just a dislocation? Is it a, a single uh, uh, entity? Uh, no. What, so what's the other part of it? They have bowing of the ulnar shaft. Yeah, right, and it's a, it's a plastic deformation of it. And a lot of times that's totally missed. So the unrecognized injury, this is obvious. You see the radial head is dislocated, but often this is not appreciated. How should that line be? How should the ulna be on the posterior aspect? Entirely straight. That's right. It should be a straight line, and here you can see that there's a bow. So you have plastic deformation of the ulna. Why is it that you need to recognize this? What's the significance of this? Well, if you don't correct that, if you don't correct that deformity, you can't get the radial head back in. You've got to, uh, you've, already, you've got to establish a correction of the deformity of the ulna first. So to facilitate the radial head reduction. So how do you think this occurs? There are different mechanisms that have been proposed. Years ago, it was thought that this was a direct blow. And, you, and, then, and actually, in the direct blow, it pushed the radial head out. And this was a, something in the 30s and 40s. And then there are studies by Evans, who took a, a, a skeletal, took the muscles off in a static thing, and he found out if you hyperpronate it, you got the same thing. And then, but that was without, that was not, a, that was a static test and really didn't take into consideration the muscles. The person that took the, in consideration of the muscles was Tompkins, and Tompkins was just a general orthopedic practitioner, I believe, in, in Michigan. And he came up with this idea, and I think his is, the, in my opinion, his is the most plausible, because it also tells you what happens. So he had proposed this occurred in three stages. What happens in the first stage? The ulna fracture. Yeah, the, well actually in the first stage, uh, that happens is that you get rapid extension of the elbow, and what does that produce? It, that leads to the second stage. What happens? Uh, that would be the ulna. Well, the second stage is when the radial head is dislocated. So now, what's the weight-bearing bone? The ulna. That's right. So now it dislocates the head laterally, anteriorly, and so that puts all the body weight on the ulna, and the ulna is not a very strong bone as far as weight bearing is concerned. You know, we don't walk on our hands or our upper extremities. And so it really doesn't tolerate that very well. So it leads to the third stage, which is it's unable to sustain the body weight. And so it fails in tension. It bends and it fails in an oblique fashion, tension. And in children a lot, of course they have, <clears throat> as we talked about before, the uh, convex, um, I mean concave surface uh, remains intact, so it remains as a, a, a um, green stick type of fracture, but it produces an apex anterior angulation that fails in tension. So the first thing that you've got to do in determining how you're going to treat this is that you have to have an understanding of what? The mechanism. That's exactly right. Because what you have to do, you have to reverse the mechanism. This mechanism is spelled backwards. So, what is the common theme that you must do in reduction of all four types of Montasia lesions? The key is the ulna. That's exactly right. Very good. You've got to correct the deformity in the ulna. That must be reduced to reestablish what? Uh, the length. That's right. Both the alignment and the length, yes. And if you don't do that, you can't get the radial head in. The first thing you've got to focus on is the ulna. So, here comes our patient with a type 1 injury. And what did we say the general mechanism was? Hyperextension. It's an extension injury. So, what is going to be the procedure to reverse that? You're going to have to flex. That's right. The, the general process is going to involve one a, a one of flexion. So, first thing you're going to focus on is what? The um, ulna diaphysis. 
Yes, right. So you got to reduce it, and the two goals are length. That's right. You got to correct the angulation and reestablish the length. And again, a lot of these are green stick fractures, so you're going to put three point pressure on it, and so you put dorsal, dorsal volar, dorsal three point pressure, and you will flex this deformity. And so when you do that, you flex it up, and hopefully that you'll correct both the angulation and length. And usually when you correct the angulation, that will reestablish the length. And so sometimes it, you have to put three-point pressure on it and get it reestablished. All right, now you got the ulna corrected. What's next? Well, your, your, radi your radial head may have already been reduced. That's right. Uh, you reduce the radial head. If it doesn't with just a, like this, this one here, the, you can see the, the fracture line has been reduced here. You can see, but the radial head is still out. So how are you going to reduce that? What mechanism? Well, you, uh, it was a pronation, so you supinate. Well, that helps some, but the primary thing is remember, it's a, what type of injury is like it? Extension injury. So how also you flexion. High that's, flexion right. that's right. Very good. It is, it's a flexion injury. So once you flex it, often that will then reduce the radial head. So hyperflexion usually realigns the capitellum with the radial head. Now, Again, here you can see with the x-ray, once you've done that, once you've established the length and alignment of the ulna, then you focus on the radial head. So, you know, in treating fractures, it's very simple. It's just two steps. One is obtain a reduction, and what's the second step? Immobilize. Maintain the reduction. So, we've got to maintain this reduction. So, what's the goals in maintaining the reduction? That it stays in flexion? Well, you want to prevent the development of the late deformities that occur. And so let's see what occurs with these that you have to worry about. One, they have a tendency to get a radial bow. Why do they do that? What force does that? The triceps? Well, actually, the triceps has a little bit, but doesn't give you the radial bow. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It's usually the forearm flexors that produce this. So, and you get a radial blow. So, if you're going to treat this non-operatively, what do you have to do? Put a good mold on your... That's right. Okay. You have to put a good mid... You place it in mid-rotation. There was a question whether you put them in supination, pronation, or mid-rotation. The reason you put them in mid-rotation so that you take the radius out and you can apply three-point molding on the ulna. So you put the three-point molding, and you can only do this if you put it in neutral. And here you can use, this is uh, sugar tongs, you can apply sugar tongs or a Munster type of cast, and you put your three-point molding on. So the other deformity that can occur is what? Uh, radial head subluxation. Yeah, or dislocation. How are you going to prevent that? What, how are you gonna, what force causes that? I guess that would be flexing. That's right. Yeah, you, you, that's right. How do you lessen the risk of deformity developing? You neutralize the biceps by moving the, el the elbow in about 110 degrees of flexion. And usually, since there's not a lot, not a fracture there, they can tolerate that. Whereas you didn't want to do that in a supercommon fracture, as we'll discuss in another session. So you can, you put them up like this, and that weakens it or neutralizes it so that it doesn't have a tendency to pull it out. So, how do you maintain this if you're going to do this? You put them in this figure of eight cast, and this was something that was popularized at the Hospital for Sick Children years ago, and you put this in kind of a figure of eight cast, holds them up like that, and you need to leave that anti-cubal area alone so you can clean out the uh, material that forms in the anti-cubital area, and you need to make sure that the sling should be incorporated in the cast because you really can't put this in a, a good, just regular sling. So the third deformity, here you talk about the third deformity. What's the third deformity that you have to worry about? You mentioned oh, it, uh, the triceps. Yes. Yeah, and what does the triceps do? If, you put, if you're going to put them up in hyperflexion, what are you tensing? The proximal fragment will go into extension. That's right. The hyperflexion of the, of the elbow activates the contracture of the triceps, 
And that results in a posterior bowing that you see. And how are you going to prevent that? And what are we going to do now? Well, if you leave it alone, a lot of times it will remodel. But when you do that, much of this angulation will remodel. My oldest son had a Montage, I remember, and afterwards he had that lump for a while, but it went away. And it usually, it, though it gives you kind of an unsightly prominence that will persist for a time, and the parents don't like that, and they get a little unhappy because, you know, they think that he looks like he's deformed and so forth. So, well, how are we going to control that? Uh, probably with your cast. Well, it's a little hard to control that with a cast and a hyperflexion to mold that very well because you got it up in hyperflexion and it's hard to put any kind of three point pressure. So, this must be maybe one indication for what? A pin. Yeah, very good. Because it's difficult to prevent non operatively, the simplest way to prevent that is just a simple IM uh, implant. And you can do it two ways. You can use the technique that was popularized in Spain by Marotti, which is a retrograde, an interdimensionary pin, or you can use a rush rod technique. And some of the people state they leave the rush rod out so that you can pull it out in the clinic. I find if you do that, that gets kind of soupy and you have to take it out too early. So usually we'll go ahead and bury it, but that's a, a personal preference here. But, but the big key is that you need to put some type of intramensionary device in there. Now, posterior angulation. Now, in adults, you normally put plates and screws. Why? Uh, to get better cortical contact? Well, that's right, better cortical contact, and usually because they're kind of comminuted in adults. And so when do you, when do you think they would be necessary in a child? When it's length unstable? That's right, when it's comminuted, the operative indications. And so it's length unstable. So, what are the operative indications? Well, you, don't, you can't get the ulna reduced, that's one. And we do know that putting the IM rod is, is a simple, non uh, very minimally invasive procedure. Or you have a failure to reduce the radial head. Now, we've talked about the surgical indications for the ulna. So let's focus then on if you can't get the radial head in. What's the usual major problem? Why can't you get the radial head in? Well, it's probably interposed tissue. Or that's right. That's right. You get interposed tissue such as? Uh, the ligaments. That's right. Most common thing is the orbicular ligament, or you may have pieces of bone, or you may have cartilage. And I think there's one uh, discussion in which the radial nerve was actually interposed in there. So. Now, this is a patient that had three attempts at a closed reduction. The ulna has been reestablished in length. What's your next approach? To get the radial head uh, reduced. Yeah, but I mean, before you do that, what are you, how are you going to evaluate that? Oh, on a lateral x-ray? Yeah, well, this is a good lateral x-ray, and this is your first step. Well, you might do an oh, arthrogram. I... Yeah, here, and what do you see in this arthrogram? that the radial head is not reduced. It looks like maybe the Yeah, you, you can see that you've got interposed tissue right there. That should be radial head is not reduced. It's not down enough. And you can see that the orbicular ligament is interposed. So this went ahead and took that out. And notice, we opened that, and notice it seemed to be a little bit unstable. And notice how the radius was stabilized, not with a transcapitellar pin, but with an oblique pin so that if it breaks, you can take it out. Okay, so the two common surgical approaches are what? Probably the coker and the catheter. Yeah, and what approach is this one? Uh, that would be that would be the coker. So that's that's right. That's the coker approach, which goes between the anconeus and the extensors. Or you can go back a little bit more posterior. And whose approach is this? It's a little bit more extensive. Boyd. Boyd approach. That's right. Very good. Glad you, that you know your surgical approaches. Very good. And that's a little bit more extensive. A lot of times the coke approach is enough because usually all you just need to do is reach in and pull out that interposed ligament. So here's a six year old fell injuring the left forearm. Here we'll get a little bit better picture here. <coughs> 
And what's this injury pattern? Type uh, 3. Well, it may be a type 3, but where's the radial head? It's lateral to the... But head. where else? What's more head. important? It's posterior. No. Okay, so th this one here is a posterior lateral displacement, a proximal radius. And the other key, the thing that will give you the key is this, the injury pattern here is a posterior angulation of the uh, ulna at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. As we'll talk about later, the type threes are usually in the olecranon and more proximal. So you have posterior angulation of the ulna. So those are the two things that tell you the type. It's a type two lesion. And so what are the two components of a type two lesion? So that would be the posteriorly proximally uh, olecranon yeah, fracture. well the first thing that's most obvious, everybody focuses on, is the posterior dislocation of the proximal radius. And that's what's been talked about in the literature, but the other thing that's very important is you also have a posterior angulation of the proximal ulna. So again, what's the overall pattern of this injury? A uh, flexion? That's right. This is one of flexion. So the incidence of type 2 lesions are pretty rare. Uh, they're really not talked out about very much because they said they're very rare. I remember when we did our first edition of a fracture textbook, we, I could only find one article and said that it, it occurred, they only had one case that it occurred in children. It was very, very rare. Since then, in the 40 years I've been working in children's fractures, I've probably accumulated about 10. So you see it, and it's very important that you recognize it. So they're commonly present, really, as equivalents. Now, DeBeto and his thing talked about things that were like uh, Montasia types, but they had other types of fractures associated with it. So usually the two is have the type two equivalents. So what are they? Well, we got the posterior angulation, which is kind of a green stick fracture at the diaphyseal metaphyseal junction. What's the other equivalent? Well, they have a radial, a lot of times they'll have a radial neck fracture. And so that, that gives you, the, the radial head is still reduced, but the, but the overall alignment of the distal ulna is posterior. So the mechanism of this lesion is one of Flexion. Yeah. So, how are you going to create it? What, what's your... Mechanism part? backwards, so extension. That's exactly right. So the child falls on a semi-flexed elbow, there's a couple things can occur. If it's a younger child, usually what happens? It'll dislocate. That's right, you get a dislocation of the elbow. If they're a little bit older, what do you get? Where well, you get this type 2 lesion that occurs and it's more common in the older age group because of the relative weakness. Although I've seen it in some younger children. So since this has a flexion mechanism, what's the general correction process? Um, Hyperextension. Yeah, right. Well, not just, just extension. So the first thing you do, how do you reduce the proximal ulna? It's a flexed... You extend the, the elbow. elbow. That's exactly right. And once you extend the elbow, that usually corrects the angulation. And it also, usually, the radial head, like once you, you mentioned that once you correct the deformity in the ulna, the radial head will correct. And so often it will correct spontaneously. If not, you may have to put a little pressure to push it up there. Now, here's our type two lesion again. This was a patient that was seen at another outside hospital. And we always have been taught you know, proximal fractures, you always put them in a long arm cast with the elbow in flexion. So this patient came in, there are two components of this deformity. You can see the posterior angulation and the radial head. And this patient showed up for follow-up. Is this the way you treat this fraction? No. No, you don't, because the deformities are still there. He still has, you know, even though the radial head is reduced, the overall, there's a posterior angulation of the radius, and the overall alignment of the radius is posterior, and of course here you have posterior.
So the appropriate treatment is you put them in a long arm cast if you're going to treat them non-operatively with the elbow extended. And usually it's always good after these, it's always good to test the quality of your reduction with an arthrogram. So what's the most common complication? Persistent deformity. Yeah, right. It's failure to recognize this as a type 2 lesion and treating them in flexion. And here's a patient saw years ago, and this one was not recognized. When, if at the time of injury, we could have corrected this with a simple extension mechanism. Now, what you're gonna, this patient has lost supination and pronation because you have rotation, when you have angulation and you've lost your arc of rotation, and to correct this is gonna be two osteotomies of the ulna and the radius. So the big problem here is the failure to recognize the nature, true nature of this fracture. And here you can see it's posterior and angulated. It was treated with a long arm cast inflection. Now, type two lesions can present in many forms. Here's a patient that <coughs> uh, really wasn't recognized as a type two initially. But there are some clues here. What are the clues that you see here? This is how the patient showed in the emergency room and was seen by the second year resident. And they just said, I've got a patient with a fracture of the ulna. What, what's, what, what else do you see? You see what a you? Posteriorly, uh, posterior apex mid-shaft ulna fracture, which is concerning for yeah. flexion type injury. And then the radial head looks like it's... Yeah, it's a little bit posterior. posterior. Yeah. So if you look a little bit closer, you see that it's posterior, and if you look at this a little bit closer, again, the proximal radius is posterior angulated, and of course you have this posterior plastic deformation. So that confirmed it was a type 2 injury, and so how are you going to correct it and stabilize it? Uh, First thing you have to do is reduce the ulna. ulna, right. So you reduce the ulna, and this one seemed to be a little bit unstable for angulation, so a pin was placed down there, and that seemed to actually reduce radial head satisfactorily. It may still be just a slight anterior. So here again, like this. So the radial head and the ulnar deformity appear to be corrected. Once you correct the ulna and recognize this as a type two lesion, so, once the fracture has been reduced, it's always, I think it's very important to confirm the quality of your reduction, of your reduction with an arthrogram. I think that you shouldn't get out of the operating room until you confirm that you've got a good concentric reduction of both the radius and the ulna with an arthrogram. Now, what are the operative indications? Well, you know, there's such a rare injury uh, very rare do you need to do that. This other patient that we just saw you, it was good to put a rod in it because it had the plastic deformation. But it's probably the same as for type 1 lesions, which are failure to maintain the ulnar reduction, and that was why the rod was placed in the other patient, or failure to reduce the radial head. And <clears throat> But it's really difficult to make any recommendations because this is such a rare entity. So here's one, one of the few that I've ever had to operate on. And what do you see here? You have posterior angulation, but what else do you see? Posterior, oh, the radial, there's a proximal radius fracture. That's exactly right. If you look at it real closely, you have a fracture of the radial neck. Remember, a lot of the type twos occur as equivalents. There's usually a, a green stick, or in this situation, it's a complete fracture. And here you can see on the AP view, you can see that same thing occurs. There's a d displacement here. And again, there is posterior angulation, but also a little bit of radial bowing. So this is an equivalent involving the radial neck. And so we reduced it in an extension, and the post fractures were then stabilized with intermediary nails retrograde. So here we go. Here's what type is this one? That's a type 3. That's right. Now we get to your type 3. So what are the components of a type 3? What do uh, you see in the ulna? Radial bowing of the ulna. That's right. That's stick. right. It's a green stick fracture with 
kind of a varus angular ocean, or like you say, radio bowing, very good. So it's, and it's usually in the olecranon, really, it's really in the proximal, and it's usually green stick. Okay, so what's the pathology of the radius? Is displaced laterally. Yeah, and laterally, or sometimes it's anterior lateral. And that produces the third problem that occurs with this. What's that radial head pushing against? The posterior interosseous That's right. It's, this is one in which there's a high incidence of nerve injuries. You don't see nerve injuries much in the type 1 and 2, but it's not uncommon to see this posterior interosseous nerve on this one here. So the mechanism of this injury is that they fall longitudinal force and uh, you have a various force applied to the extended elbow. And this usually occurs probably in the kids that don't have much of a carrying angle. And so the overall deformity of this injury is one of... Varus. That's right. Very good. It's a varus. So you're going to reduce it. You've got to reduce them. You've got to re reverse the, pro the uh, um, re um, deformities. So what's the first stage? What do you have to reduce first? The ulna first. Yeah. And so you extend the elbow to lock the olecranon. And so what kind of a force are you going to apply? Uh, a valgus force. That's right, a valgus force. And that will correct that varus deformity ulna. And usually, again, when you do that, the radial head usually spontaneously reduces. If not, you may have to put a little pressure on it. So, Postoperatively, it's very difficult because of the proximal location to put three-point pressure on the olecranon because it's very proximal and you've got the radial head there and so it's very difficult. And we've tried both with flexion and extension cast and <clears throat> this is a, how I've kind of learned that it's very difficult to do this. This is a patient that had a type three and I put it in the long arm cast and extension what do you think about that reduction? It looks... Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah you better, because this, I did this. You know, I thought, and I patted myself on the back. I thought it was really good. <laughs> both, both of them appeared to be satisfactory. The proximal ulna was too. I went out of town and came back. This patient came back 10 days later and see one of my associates. And he took an x-ray and what's going on? Now you have a radial bow of the... Oh no, it's a green stick fracture. Yeah, and it's very difficult to put the three-point pressure on this, and you have the flexor forces applying to it. So, what he did was, and this is subluxed again, so it's not aligned again. So the next step was to examine this patient under anesthesia, and here with an arthrogram, you can confirm you've got incongruity, that it's not well aligned. So, what are you gonna do? Now I would put an intramedullary rod for the ulna. That's right. You have to re-manipulate it, then you stabilize it with a, a large, and this one has to be a pretty large rod because it's a green stick, somewhat comminuted fracture. So once you do that, and then you confirm your alignment with an arthrogram. So because of the high incidence of type 3, these late deformities, I now will Ohms routinely put a intermediary pin in there, and it's usually a pretty good size one, a rush rod or a, or a quarter inch or three eighths inch pin in there, as you can see here. So, and you also do a perform an arthrogram to determine the articular congruity. Now, what happens if this gr green stick ulnar deformity persists? What are you going to get? Here's a patient that had a type 3, was treated with a cast, came back, we'll look at it a little bit closer, and what do you think he came back for? He probably lost supination and pronation? Or yeah, he had, but he lost some of it, but Is he had synostosis? Huh? Synostosis? No, he was having pain because he's got an incongruous joint here. So he had an incongruous joint, and so every time he rotate, he, and he was quite active using do a lot, and he was starting to have pain. And the only way that this could be corrected was with an opening wedge osteotomy. And probably would have been better to put a plate on it than a large. You can see it put a couple of pins in there to hold it in a bone graft. 
and now we've reestablished the incongruity. Here's an eight-year-old fell on the outstretched arm, reduction maneuver three times. What's your concern here? That's not acceptable. Yeah. So now it's going to need to go to the operating room? For why? So that you can stabilize the ulna. Well, that's right. And and this one we did years ago, and this before we did a lot of stabilization, but why can't you get the radial head in? They're probably interposed. That's right, exactly what happened. The orbicular ligament was interposed in that, as you can see here. So the next step was to go ahead and take it out, and we got to get a roach through a coker approach. And nowadays I would put a large rod down there, like that. Articular alignment was reestablished. All right. What about fractures occurring in the radius and ulna? The, you get the emergency room, you're a junior resident, you're a senior resident now, and your junior resident calls you and said, Doctor, I've got this child with fractures of the diaphysis of the radius and ulna. And you should see, let me see you, show you the x ray. What's your next step? Uh, to examine the patient? Yeah, well, and it, you got the patient after that. You, you've examined the patient, nerve vascular intact, and the, he's got these x-rays. What's your next step? Uh, try to reduce the fracture. Yeah, but before you even do that, what do you always have to look at? Well, you need to get adequate x-rays. And the, the few times that I've seen missed montages have been like this, where they had both, everybody focused on the radius and on the shaft, and he's got a dislocation. So what is this fracture pattern? This would be a type four. That's right, it's a type four. And the components are fractures of the diaphyses of both the radius and ulna, and a dislocation using the anterior of the radial head, using the anterior. So, biomechanically, what's it? How are you gonna reduce it? Uh, it's a floating elbow, right? Yeah, you have to um, you have to fix distal. That's right. The incidence is still this one again is very rare in children, in very few mechanisms. The mechanism is probably the same as the type <coughs> one lesion. So what you have to do here, non-operative is kind of difficult. This is one may require repeated manipulations. What type do we see here? We see a type four. They put it in a cast and it looks like they were lucky and they got, although that radial head's still a little bit anterior and acceptable, they thought it was acceptable. Comes back in a week and what's happened? You've lost your reduction of your radius and ulna and so no longer satisfactory. So you gotta re-manipulate it and after the second reduction, they did it. In six weeks post-reduction, it's pretty well aligned, but it, it took a long time and you had to do a couple reductions. So, the message here for type four lesions, it's very difficult to manage non-operatively. So, what's the best management process for reducing these? She just told you. Um, an intramedullary fixation? That's right. Or what you need to do, it's a type four lesion and you want to convert this to a type one, and you do this by putting intermediary nails in there, and now you have a lever arm, and now you have a type one lesion, and then you treat it like a type one lesion. Here's one that was done by one of my associates. This was kind of an equivalent. You can see two fractures of the uh, lecranon and a fracture of the radial neck, and this was treated with retrograde intermediary nails and this one came back and had one year post fracture and had good alignment of the radial head and had full supination and pronation. You can see it's full remodeling. So, let's see if you learn anything in this session. Here's a five year old fell off the monkey bars and he was kind of a monkey anyway. So he complained of pain in his right forearm. He was seen, splinted, sent into the, our clinic by the primary care of the nerve vascular intact, no other injury complaints, like pronation to neutral by about 20 degrees, had full supination. It takes three weeks to gain an appointment. And so he presents now 
right here, you can already see there's some a little bit of callus right here. It's already starting to heal. But is this what is this fracture pattern? Well, your next step is that you need to make sure you see the whole forearm. And so this is kind of anterior lateral. Is it acceptable? No. So surgical intervention. The first thing you want to do is what about an orthogram to check congruity? And you find with an orthogram, before you do any manipulation, that your radial head is out. And you also got angulation of the ulna. So what's the first thing you have to do? Correct the ulna. Very good. Looks like you're learning. Yes, good. sir. Yeah. So you reduce and stabilize the ulna, and you do this with the technique that we described in the first session about putting it over a fulcrum. Same as for plastic destructive. Then you use a flexible intermediary nail and correct that. And notice now that the pronation has improved and an integrated Russian nail may have been better. It's hard to say. And the message is <clears throat> beware of the occult type 3 lesions could produce a radial capitellar incongruity. So we've learned about all of these type 1, 2, 3, and 4, and if you track them correctly, I don't need to tell you about the complications. <laughs> well, the reason I'm going to discuss the complications is because that someone else may have treated it and then they sent it to you with a complication. So you may end up treating someone else's complication. The, probably the most compli common complication in Montasia lesions is Anterior, or radial head dislocation. That's right. Failure to recognize that you had a dislocation. Now this one here, it said there was no fracture. And you know, here, the section was directed towards the diaphyseal fractures. And here, they had inadequate radiographs initially. You had inadequate radiographs. So these are the things that, that can occur. Now you have unappreciated radial head dislocations. If they're asymptomatic, should they be treated? Well, there's some people say that these chronic dislocations are benign. I don't think we have a lot of good long-term studies. And these people said they're kind of benign, just leave them alone. Other people say, well, there are some long-term problems. They have a lot of valgus instability. Um, they can't weight bear on their arms and so forth. And these people say you ought to be pretty aggressive with them. So the indications are general. If it's less than 12 years of age, absence of secondary radial head changes, and specific progressive radial capitellar subluxation, or progressive valgus deformity, you probably ought to correct it, or limited range of motion of forearm rotation, or progressive pain. So you decide to repair the residual deformities. What again is the first thing you got to correct? The correct the ulna. That's right. You need to correct, look at it, and evaluate it, and correct the deformity of the ulna. Then you got to reduce and stabilize the radial head. So here's our patient showed up one year post injury, and I already given you a clue. It's got two deformities. What are they? The ulna is not uh, straight, and then the radial head is. Uh, That's exactly right. And uh, the radial head is out. What's the first thing you're going to do? Want to uh, correct the ulna? Yeah, you do an extension osteotomy. In some people, a flexion osteotomy, actually. You kind of put in an extension. And some people say that that's all you need to do. And if you do that, that's sufficient. Uh, other people say, no, you need to repair the radial or the abricular ligament. So, the, this one, this is whose, whose procedure is this, do you know? This came out of England. This is where the bell taws, where you use central part of the triceps and reestablish this here, reestablish this. The problem, my experience with this, is that it'll hold the radial head in, but it'll, you, you get a little limitation of supination and pronation. You get some scarring in there. and. You can pa pass it through a hole in the ulna, or you can secure it with a bone anchor, or you can use mini staples to secure that down. Now, Peterson said that the, the bell is not anatomic because 
the bell tons doesn't really centralize it like it should. And he, in, in seal, said that this is the way you should do it. I've never done this, and this looks like it would be a little bit complicated, but it is probably the more anatomical repair that you ought to consider. So, some of the other complications seen with Montasia lesions are? Residual well, nerve bone. injuries, yeah. And which, which type has the highest injury in nerve injury? Type three. Type three, that's right. Redislocation or tardy dislocation of the radial head, that's been shown mainly because, again, if you have plastic deformation proximally, it, that plastic deformation will, unless you really stabilize it well with three-point fixation on your cast, which is very difficult to do in proximal fractures, it will reform and then it'll get a, a late dislocation of the radial head. There are other associated fractures that occur with this and so forth. So, I want to thank you for bearing with me through this <laughs> session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.